everyone, and welcome to this webinar, a global shipping report for 2024, which will dive into two crucial topics, global trends in risk and issues impacting, impacting shipping. My name is David Barker. I'm the head of global marketing and communications at Inchcape Shipping Services, and I'll be your host today. Joining me today, we have Ian Wilkinson, Vice President of Sales Excellence at Inchcape Shipping Services, and Robert Peters, Associate Director of Risk Analytics at Ambry. Robert has been with Ambry's intelligence department, followed by Ambry Analytics for over five years now. He formerly lived in Saudi Arabia, where he has a project management and technology consultant. Robert is a University of Oxford politics gradu graduate. Ian's career began in engineering before transitioning to the, um, the technology sector, delivering business transformation through commercial strategy and execution. Ian joined four years ago and he heads up our sales excellence department, creating real value and material outcomes for customers and, and partners. Today's webinar, we're going to cover a recap of the security threats in 2023, a 2024 outlook on global trends, 2024 challenges affecting global shipping, the importance of reliable information in times of crisis, and recommendations. Following the presentations, we'll open up for questions and I invite everyone to use the Q&A panel to ask any questions you have. So without further ado, over to you, Robert. Thank you very much, David. Just as an introduction to Ambre, for those who um, are new to us, we are the largest maritime security risk management company in the world. Um, we've been operating for 14 years. Uh, we've supported more than 34,000 tasks over those years. We've moved into the digital space. So we support more than 3,700 vessels digitally at this moment. Our team, um, which performs as part of Ambre Analytics, is drawn from international relations and security experts, a graduate team based all around the world. And we draw upon, we work together with our armed guards, of whom we have about a thousand, and we deliver services to more than 800 clients across 200 locations. What's fantastic about Ambre, um, working as an analyst, is that we get to put our recommendations into practical effect. So today we will be advising armed guards on the water. We will be advised working with our training team. We'll be in communications with our operations team and we'll be advising clients yet to embark through our account management team. What I'll be covering over the next few slides are some of the key threats which have emerged throughout 2023 and give an indication as to how they might develop in 2024. I'll start with Israel Gaza. Since the beginning of the conflict on the 7th of October, we've seen 885 alerts in port cities. These are air raid alerts in port cities, but 98% of those alerts have been in Ashkelon or Ashdod. There are other ports like Eilat, Hadira and Haifa where we've seen far fewer alerts. In the initial phases of the conflict, we saw infiltrations and near misses in Ashkelon. You can see an Im the top image um, showing a rocket fall in Ashkelon Marina. And the, the Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other militant groups from Gaza have generally targeted civilian urban areas and military sites. There have been zero crew casualties or merchant vessel losses over the course of the conflict. Ashkelon was temporarily closed, the port, and, and there were cargo restrictions in ports and some diversions to Haifa. Some container shipping lines and cruise ships have diverted, um, but around the uh, container shipping lines in particular, they've started um, to resume transits and call um, Haifa. In terms of outlook, you can see on the right hand side a graph showing the number of air raid alerts per day uh, over port cities. You can see that this dramatically reduced after the first couple of days. 
Now, Hamas and the PIJ capability is largely exhausted or it has been destroyed by the IDF. The, as a result, the risk to vessels calling Ashkelon and Ashdod has reduced considerably. Now, in terms of the longer term outlook, the politics of the reconstruction of Gaza and the post-conflict security arrangements will be critical. Right now, a ceasefire is under discussion. This is a longer term ceasefire. It's been mooted as 30 days to 60 days. Hamas would like a longer term ceasefire. In terms of a longer term solution, Israel has demanded the removal of senior Hamas figures from G Gaza. Hamas has rejected this so far, but we'll see how these negotiations play out in the longer term. In terms of regional spillover, the, the regionalization of this conflict happened fairly quickly. So Hezbollah and some Hamas units in Lebanon joined the conflict on the 8th of October. And we have mapped where the air raid sirens have been triggered in Israel. You can see here that the vast majority of those have been limited to what is called the confrontation line. So parts of northern Israel. Hezbollah has not wanted or needed a full scale conflict. And in terms of needed, what they're seeing is they are displacing Israeli settlers in these areas, and that is a victory for Hezbollah. And there's pressure, political pressure on the Israel war cabinet to do something about that and to return those people safely to the, and securely to their homes. Hezbollah largely respected the November ceasefire, which lasted for a few days. However, Lebanon has not implemented a UN Security Council resolution, which um, request, which, which instructed the, the removal of militants, um, the Israel side of the Litani River in Lebanon, and called upon the disarmament of armed groups, including Hezbollah. Now the Israeli war cabinet is exploring negotiation options, but is keeping other options on the table. So there is the risk that Israel um, will have to launch operations in southern Lebanon. But that isn't imminent. In terms of another part of the regional spillover, of course, there's been Israel and US Houthi conflict. So the Houthis started to target Israel, Israeli territory since the 19th of October. This was with uh, long range unmanned aerial vehicles and, vi and missiles. This did cause significant business disruption. Um, ILAT port calls have fallen considerably as a result of the targeting. However, due to the range of Israel, Israeli territory and due to the interceptions by the US, Egypt, Israel, even Saudi Arabia on an occasion, um, have meant that the Houthis have refocused their efforts onto denying merchant shipping affiliated with Israel um, from crossing uh, the Bab el Mandeb and the Southern Red Sea. So from the 14th of November, the Houthis threatened Israeli owned shipping. On the 10th of December, the Houthis targeted companies trading with Israel, so which were not directly owned, uh, operated or managed by Israeli companies. And on the 11th of January, in response to the threat to merchant shipping at large, the US and UK launched airstrikes against Houthi military targets. And subsequently, the Houthis threatened US and UK shipping. And that has continued until today. The Houthi target choice is deliberate, but can be outdated. They can be using out of date publicly available information and they have not been thorough in de-conflicting interests. So, for example, we've seen vessels which have um, loaded in Russian ports um, which have been targeted and we would not expect the Houthis to want to target those uh, interests. In terms of the likelihood of targeting, in the beginning of the conflict, the targeting was 
um, focused on Israel affiliated vessels um, through ownership. And it was assessed to be an unlikely probability that a particular vessel would be targeted. However, as the numbers of vessels transiting this area has reduced, the probability to a specific vessel being of a specific vessel being targeted has increased because there are fewer others available to target. Now we're seeing that a suspicious approach, so that's an attempted targeting of a vessel by UAV or missile um, to Israeli, US or UK affiliated merchant shipping is assessed to be likely. So it's moved from unlikely at the start of the conflict towards the likely um, probability. Now, this is really important when we talk about merchant shipping and threats to merchant shipping. The vast majority of threats uh, to a particular merchant vessel anywhere else in the world is in that remote chance box. It's less than 1%. When you talk about West African piracy, Singapore Strait robbery, all these other threats, it's usually in the remote chance area. So this is a really um, threatening development to merchant shipping. Now, in terms of um, the likelihood of damage, so if a vessel is being targeted and then what happens next, we've seen up until the 22nd of January, at least 28 unique merchant vessels threatened. Fewer than half of those have been damaged or seized. The percentage damaged or seized has not changed significantly since the US and UK airstrikes on Houthi military targets. So although they have, although the US and UK have degraded the Houthi capability in terms of targeting, gone after, for example, radar stations, the um, efficacy of the targeting has not fallen significantly. Now, when hit, when we talk about risk, we talk about likelihood and impact. And when we look at the impact on merchant shipping, so far, um, only one crew member has been, treat, ha, has been treated for shock and there have been no fatalities. 100% of merchant vessels have been able to transit under their own power following um, hits by missiles or UAVs. And 58% of, of attacks have caused serious damage, which means structural damage to a vessel. Now, in the next slide, what I want to underline is that though there haven't been fatalities, there have been near misses, and this is a threat to life. You can see here in the video that there was an explosion caused by a missile, and afterwards we can see some crew members running away from that explosion on deck. We recommend that the shipping industry conducts risk assessments and adhere to those recommendations. So those risk assessments should con should consider the operations needed to needed on board that ship uh, to continue its voyage but if there is any non-essential work to be completed on deck do not do it in higher threat areas so this this vessel's risk assessment should have recommended no crew deck movements this this vessel was assessed to be high risk due to the company's trade uh, with Israel and it was the third time in 24 hours that this vessel had reported an incident. Now there's a there's a there's a a misnomer about where the targeting can take place. The Houthis have the capability to target basically anywhere in the Red Sea due to the UAV range that they have and the Gulf of Aden too. In terms of targeting, it can be a lot harder the further away you get. And also, of course, there's a higher chance of an interception um, the further away you are from where they're firing these. This was the farthest north since the 19th of November that the Houthis targeted a vessel, but the Houthis have struck a merchant vessel north of 21 North before in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, when that conflict was, um, was more active. In terms of outlook, I've produced a graph here on the right, which also shows 
Houthi threats to specific merchant vessels over time. What you see is um, from, from the day one of when they started to target vessels, an increase and then a decrease as vessel traffic started to reroute away. Then there was a gap and then the US and UK military strikes on the Houthis followed and then the Houthis followed with um, additional attacks on merchant shipping. And that is continuing at the moment, even though we're seeing a large number of merchant vessels affiliated with those countries reroute. So military strikes alone are unlikely to stop the Houthis. The Americans have announced that they will um, designate the Houthi uh, organization a terrorist organization, which will come into effect in the coming weeks unless there is a de-escalation. These sanctions could actually trigger a humanitarian crisis in Yemen. So they should not be done lightly because they will affect ordinary people in Yemen. In the short term, more vessels associated with Israel, the US and UK will reroute, and we've seen that. However, purely Chinese, Russian, Greek, Singaporean, Turkish shipping is, is highly unlikely to be impacted and is continuing through. Now, there is assessed to be a threat to Israel-owned shipping, so a narrower a pool of ships after the Israel-Gaza conflict is, is resolved or uh, is, is subject to a prolonged ceasefire. And this is because what we've seen is an anti-Zionist rhetoric coming from the Houthis and a popularity amongst some elements in Yemen um, for the Houthis for targeting Israel-affiliated merchant shipping. And we've also seen their backers in Iran continue to target merchant shipping for the last few years, which I'll come on to. In terms of the wider context for the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, there has been a de-escalation of the conflict with Saudi Arabia um, through the involvement in the Yemen civil war. We assess that this will likely last, the de-escalation will likely last, but that the threat to Yemeni government controlled oil and gas exports is likely to persist uh, because this is a negotiating lever for the Houthis. Now, in terms of the risk to the North to South Cape of Good Hope trade, Somali pirate action groups have returned and have attacked two bulk carriers recently. And these PAGs hijacked a bulk carrier and boarded another up to 600 miles offshore Somalia. So operating at distance, and I'll come on to the reasons why uh, we assess them to be doing that. Right now, there's an ongoing negotiation um, for the release of that hijacked bulker and the ransom negotiations are talking about a, a ransom in, in, in terms of millions of dollars. The cause is political instability in the Puntland region of Somalia. It is not to do with um, particularly uh, counter IUU fishing, as is a common narrative. So the pres president of Puntland sought re-election. He achieved that and he chose not to rotate the presidency to the next subclan whose turn it was. And other subclans have been disempowered. And we know that some of the pirates involved in this hijacking um, were drawn from these subclans. Control of the state so access to the presidency, access to other positions within the Puntland uh, administration was important for revenue distribution within these subclans. And particularly fisher fisheries licensing by the Puntland government was um, a source of revenue for the government. Uh, and this is why this political crisis initially resulted in the hijacking of fishing dows, which were operating offshore Puntland. If you go on to the next slide. So the security industry and, and shipping industry gen generally has been a victim of its own success. So the suppression of piracy led to far fewer incidents, 
when you look at the types of incidents that were occurring prior to the re-emergence of piracy in November 2023, um, those incidents were limited to armed robberies. So they were taking place inside territorial waters and they were opportunist. The industry and um, the shipping industry removed the a high risk area designation subsequently because there were fewer incidents deep offshore and Lloyd's, so the insurance market, also reduced their listed areas from the larger box you can see on the right to their smaller box and much closer to Somalia. Now, there is a tendency amongst shipping not to apply all of the best management practices outside of the insurance listed areas. And responding to uh, demand and competitive forces, both within the private maritime security market and also the shipping market, which wanted to pay um, less for armed guards. Uh, the vessel borne armories um, through which the armed guards operate moved much closer to those new listed area boundaries. And as you can see here, the um, boarding of the Lila Norfolk and the hijacking of the ruin occurred outside of the insurance listed areas. Now, point defence, in terms of what's next, point defence, so defence of vessels, uh, is essential because vessels can wait for 24 to 48 hours for navies to arrive in this area because this is such a vast area. I said I would come on to the Iranian threat. The Iranians have targeted vessels for two main reasons. The first is sanctions related and is in a tit for tat um, way. So, for example, in 2023, the US seized Iranian oil on board a tanker called the Suez Rajan, and they issued a fine in the multi million dollars for that. And in response, Iran seized the tanker carrying US bound um, cargo and harassed other US merchant shipping. They then later seized the St. Nicholas which was formerly called the Suez Rajan when she returned to the area as a response to that particular company for cooperating, as they see it, with the Americans. This kind of um, sanctions related um, tit for tat has been ongoing since July 2019 when the British seized a, a Iranian cargo off Gibraltar. The second reason why um, the Iranians are acting is to target Israel-owned merchant shipping. This has, we, we've seen over the course of 2023 and at the beginning of 2024, long range, highly targeted attacks on this shipping using UAVs. And it's been ongoing since February 2021 as part of what we would describe as a grey zone conflict between the two um, countries. One of the implications of the attacks in the Red Sea have been that merchant shipping is likely to consider bunkering um, towards the east and um, towards Singapore. Sorry. I'll wait, I'll wait for the slide to load. There you are. Sorry. So that's fine. So um, in 2023, we saw an increase in the number of reported incidents that's not necessarily an increase in the number of incidents. And we assess that the Singapore Information Fusion Centre's outreach into the shipping industry has likely increased the, the um, willingness of the shipping industry to report incidents to the IFC. Something really important to note in this area is that even if the reported incidents have gone up in the uh, straits, Actually, when you look at the risk in anchorages, in the Singaporean anchorages, the risk is assessed to be low, and that's largely due to Singaporean law enforcement, which we see um, patrolling these areas. And, and though, in terms of the, the, the risk to certain types of vessels, though bulkers have reported more incidents, we assess, having spoken to tanker operators, that tankers were also impacted but incidents amongst that sector have gone underreported, largely because they do not want to have to report those incidents to their charters. There have been regional efforts to break organised crime groups, 
which means that um, we are seeing fewer uh, hijacking events and the, sea and the uh, taking of fuel. And instead, what we're seeing is a focus on theft or armed robbery. Crews are advised to avoid confronting the criminals. And there was a particularly serious incident in 2023 where a crew member was stabbed. Um, there have been arrests on this Indonesian island in October and following, following um, arrests in recent years, we have seen a reduction in armed robberies offshore. Uh, there was one subsequent to these arrests. So we shall see, um, but the pace has actually slowed. So we'll see if this has a longer term effect. In terms of West African piracy, what's really interesting from looking at this as an as an analyst is the global implication, the, the global trends impacting regional trends and how those interact. So across all of 2023, there were only three hijackings and three kidnappings. And those three kidnappings involved 15 crew members. And you can see why I'm saying only because this has this, this is a marked reduction on previous years. A byproduct of geopolitics in the Middle East and their impact on the oil markets and maintaining a higher oil price could be could lead to a disincentivization of West African piracy. And there is a correlation between um, higher oil prices and lower piracy levels. The pirates can make more money as organized crime groups um, protecting the export of um, illicitly refined products than they can from kidnapping crew members. The incidents that do occur are, are assessed more likely to impact bunker product tankers and commercial fishing vessels which rely upon those bunker product tankers as the oil price is relatively high. However, this business model could be disrupted by ongoing Nigerian efforts to counter that illicit crude siphoning refining and bunker trade, and by counter piracy operations such as those listed um, by regional states and also international states who do deploy such as the Danes. As we, as we come round the Cape and move upwards, there is a risk or a safety risk. This isn't a security uh, threat as such, though it can develop in rare cases as a security threat. And this is mainly a safety um, threat to um, business disruption of merchant shipping. There are pockets where you see large movements of migrants and asylum seekers from Africa towards Europe and the Canary Islands. The Senegalese and Spanish Coast Guard are active in the Atlantic where there are fewer merchant vessel interventions as a result. And um, but they do travel in, they do tend to travel in larger groups than what you see in the Mediterranean. And in the Mediterranean, most operations are carried out by um, NGOs, so non-governmental organizations, charities who um, operate their own um, search and rescue uh, vessels and pick up migrants and asylum seekers from vessels leaving Tunisia and Libya. Now, some of those vessels are actually financed by the German government, and we have upcoming elections in Germany, um, which might influence the funding of those NGOs. Now, in terms of impact on merchant shipping, what tends to be the impact? So they tend to get diverted towards migrant boats, which can incur, incur fuel costs. And it can impact their number of days on hire, and it can also impact whether or not they can fulfill their contractual obligations at their next port of call, whether they can reach there on time. And on average, we've calculated that the impact on a merchant vessel responding to one of these uh, events is around $500,000. Now, there is also reputational damage if they do not respond to these events. So NGOs and charities call them out if they do not respond. And they also call them out if they return those people to Libya or Tunisia, where they've come from. Now, there is another 
uh, element to this, which is that most merchant vessels are crewed by 20 people, 10 to 30 people. They are not equipped to accommodate the numbers of people that we are seeing on the water, where you can have literally hundreds of people on board fishing boats or dozens of people on smaller boats, which are which are unseaworthy. Now, having to manage their safety is a challenge. Now, some of these people, particularly if these merchant vessels are destined for Libya or Tunisia, some of these people do not want to go back there and they have self harmed and they have threatened to harm crew members. So you've seen some high profile cases where migrants in a minority, vast, vast minority, but significant, um, have threatened crew members and you've ended up seeing um, military responses to support those merchant vessels. And lastly, I want to finish with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So in terms of merchant shipping, not in terms of the land war, but in terms of merchant shipping, there was a major shift in 2023 when the UN Black Sea Grain Initiative um, was not renewed in July. As the negotiations failed, Russian and Ukrainian forces targeted one another's port facilities. So they went after, for example, grain silos, um, fuel depots, and the Ukrainians extended their attacks geographically early this year. So they have targeted St. Petersburg and Ustluga in the Baltics. Now, a lack of damage to merchant shipping whilst each side were attacking um, port facilities indicated that both sides wanted to um, show restraint for particularly for easily attributable attacks. That means if there's an attack on the port facility and it's claimed by the Ukrainians, um, if, if there's an attack on the Russian port facility, it's likely conducted by the Ukrainians and therefore that is it is more easily attributable. However, um, a Bolka was hit, the KMAX ruler was hit whilst she was in Yuzhny and by a Russian air to surface missile and it killed the pilot. And that was the only merchant vessel seafarer death in 2023 caused by a security event. Sea mine events offer plausible deniability. So the, at the outset of the conflict, the Ukrainian side um, laid hundreds of mines to prevent an amphibious attack on places like Odessa. And after the non-renewal of that grain, grain corridor, the Ukrainians accused the Russians of laying sea mines in, that, in the new Ukrainian unilateral grain corridor. Now, in September, two general cargo ships suffered such serious damage that they were grounded to avoid sinking and three others reported incidents. And when you look at the traffic in the areas where these vessels um, hit sea mines or were very close to sea mines, dozens of merchant vessels had gone through there over the, over the previous months. So, and, and we also saw an incident where a sea mine um, exploded behind a vessel which appeared to be a, therefore a bottom sea mine. And it was these bottom sea mines which the Ukrainians accused the Russians of laying. So it does look as if the Russians were laying these mines in these areas. And that's why you've seen um, this damage, this uptick in damage to merchant shipping um, over, over the course of 2023 since um, the non-renewal of that grain initiative. Now, in terms of outlook, if the Russians were able to um, move the front lines towards Mik back towards Mikhailov in in the west, um, northwest of Crimea, more than a dozen stranded merchant vessels could once again be at heightened risk of collateral damage, where we've seen um, missiles being fired across the river, the bug estuary there. And we've seen the, that merchant vessels have been exposed to that collateral damage in Kherson and Okhotsk um, over the last few months. And on the last slide, I'll just summarise what we can do about this. So this is from our digital side of things. We also, of course, have our uh, armed security. 
and Maritime Security Liaison Officers. So we provide a service called Fathom, which is a platform which contains all the incidents, our analysis, our own dynamic elevated threat areas. We provide that mainly to company security officers and underwriters. Uh, Guardian is, uh, so this is a full-blown security as a service, getting your vessel from A to B as um, safely and secure, securely as you can. Um, this would include uh, recommendations for armed security or not, depending upon um, your particular vessel and your particular route. And it manages your risk throughout that voyage. And in terms of Sentinel, this is one of our newest digital products. This is an intelligent uh, advisory service. So it looks at where your vessel is. It looks at events proximate to your vessel um, events um, approximate to the root of your vessel, which is calculated using AI. And it is um, lo looking at events occurring at the destination of your vessel, which again uses AI. That's it from my side. I'll now hand over. Thank you very much, Robert, for that insightful overview. Um, if you would like to get in touch with Robert or his team at Embry, we will put the contact details at the end of the presentation and in the chat section. Um, at this point, I'd now like to ask Ian to take the floor for his segment on the 2024 challenges affecting global shipping and the recommendations. Over to you, Ian. Yeah, um, thanks, David, and thanks, Robert. Um, I can see we've got some questions coming in, so uh, we will make sure that uh, we have time for questions. Uh, if you do have questions, can you can you type them into the uh, Q&A box, please? And then we can make sure that uh, we can capture all of those as well. So thanks for that. Um, so um, Inchcape Shipping Services, we're, we're a leading global uh, port agent. Um, we've been um, trading for 177 years, so we, we have an awful lot of history. And uh, one of my colleagues says that over that period of time, we've seen all manner of incidents and challenges in, in the organization, but they, they do evolve and, and they do change over time. Um, one of the, uh, I think one of, the, one of the advantages that we do give to organizations is that we employ over 3,000 uh, port agents or people actually within, within the locations. Um, in 60 countries, um, covering several thousand ports, and we're actually handling uh, about 100,000 port calls and, uh, and, and jobs each year. Um, we provide all of that uh, underpinned by um, a, a program of governance and, and compliance as well. It's one of the things that Inchcape are, are certainly known for is, is our government, governance processes that, that we abide to. Um, Consequently, that that history, but that that day to day activity that we, we have gives us an awful lot of knowledge of what's actually happening in the port. So uh, Robert's presentation focused, I think, a lot on the global, the macro sort of issues. And, and what I'd like to talk about is very much the, you know, what's happening on the day to day um, with, within the locations. So we'll start. We'll start with the hot topic that is that is obviously Suez and, and the Red Sea. We've seen um, a 38 percent decline in Suez transits. Um, that's from first uh, of January to 23rd of January versus the same period in December. So even in that sort of time, we've we've seen a um, we've seen a decline. And despite what's been reported in um, a number of trade press and, uh, and and journals. The Suez is absolutely not closed, um, and we continue to see significant traffic. Um, anywhere between 40 and 50 vessels a day are are transiting. Um, Saturdays we do notice a big dip on Saturdays. Not quite sure why that would Saturday's material, but but it, it is. Um, and uh, if you want to know more about the day-to-day -day activity that's happening there. You can go to the Inchcape um, website and sign up for adv um, advisories, and we we publish a, a daily advisory with this this kind of information. Um, one update which isn't in here is that um, the Suez Canal Authority has called uh, an emergency meeting or a meeting with all of the major agents on Monday, um, and we'll provide updates uh, on the outcomes of that um, early next week probably most likely through through the advisories as well. Now, um, Robert did touch on this, but 
you know, there are there are a lot of vessels um, trading and 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 sailing through uh, the Red Sea and and out into the uh, out and around Aden. Um, what people don't know is there's actually 50 ports between Egypt or between Suez um, and the Yemen coast. So Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Sudan all, all have um, ports and locations there. Um, uh, there's also, again, as Richard hinted, the, the Russian Chinese and some other uh, tonnage is, is uninterrupted. Um, I think there's a bit of um, uh, a bit of a, a misunderstanding about um, Particularly some of the, the sanctions that have been been applied to Russian uh, Russian uh, oil and, and Russian trade in general, um, Russian grain, Russian fertilizer is not sanctioned at all, and uh, it's only Russian crude oil that has a sale price of over sixty dollars, um, which is which is effectively affected by sanctions. Um, anything below that um, is is okay to trade. As a poor agent, that gives us quite a lot of a challenge trying to work out. So, what was the what was the price of this crude? But um, uh, we have we have various sanctions and uh, compliance processes we work through as well. Um, one of the things that again Robert touched on was um, um, suspicious sightings. Now, um, we within Inchcape we actually employ several um, former master mariners and, and former ships cast captains, and uh, one of my colleagues, Captain Amit Chitness, has sailed uh, and mastered um, crude vessels through um, th that region for, for several years. And um, during his time, he said that dows are, are very, very common. And whilst you do hear a lot about, uh, we've seen this dow and, and that dow, you know, the, 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 there's a lot there. They're used for um, fishing, they're used for uh, movement of small goods. And there are also, there's been, a, you know, uh, for many, many years, there's a history of smuggling as well. So sightings of dows on their own is not uh, an unusual circumstance. I think, I think the one thing, and again, Robert touched on this, is the uncertainty is going to remain in the region um, well past any ceasefire or, or resolution, um, particularly for Israeli vessels. But I think for, for any organisation, um, they, they will need to take that into account. Um, and I dare say the uh, the insurers and the PNI clubs will do the same as well. So um, the the Cape of Good Hope is is an alternative. Um, what's been very heavily reported in in the press is that um, uh, the the rerouting of uh, container vessels, um, and in particular, you do see on 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 various sites the um, the AIS positions or the vessel positions of ultra uh, large um, uh, container vessels, of which there's there's about 140 or 150 going around um, Africa just at the moment. Um, so, and and again, it's just been reported in the last week or so that um, companies have have just started to reroute. The, the reality is they've been rerouting for quite a while. Um, and and consequently, when you when you look at the latest um, AIS maps, this one is uh, and I'll, I'll explain what this is looking at in a minute. But um, the the you know they've 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 been making these voyages for a good two to three weeks already. Complications it actually gives is that clearly you're going to need husbandry, you're going to need bunkering, um, but but these are already available. There's lots of capacity. There's lots of supply at Gibraltar, Al Jazeera as, as you come out of the Med, um, also around Southern Africa, um, and in particularly around um, Port Louis in um, in Mauritius as well. So there is capacity, um, and um, uh, there is the there is availability and, and slots for these as well. Now I spoke about uh, container vessels and and how. Um, you know, it's very obvious that there's there's very few around Suez and Red Sea. When you look at uh, when you look at the tankers, the larger tankers, you can see that it's a much more confusing um, image. So uh, this is of um, LR1, LR2, ultra large, and uh, VLCC uh, tankers in the region. Uh, snapshot I took on the uh, on the 23rd a few days ago, and you'll see that you know clearly trade around West Africa. Um, in and around um, uh, the Arabian Sea um, continues, and it's 
it's not as black and white perhaps as you may see with um, see with um, container vessels there as well. Um, one last comment on this before we move on is that weather plays a massive can play a massive part in in disruption as well. So um, Port Lewis in particular in in Mauritius has been closed for a couple of days off and on over the past few weeks due to um, uh, due to some cyclones that have um, have made berthing there very very difficult. Um, but I think one thing um, uh, one thing that is clear. No, it's okay, David. You can you can go on to the next one. Um, the, the one thing that is clear is the industry is adapting. Um, you know, people are making decisions day by day um, on commercially as to you know what's viable, um, what's the cost of uh, you know uh, the operational cost of the journey, um, what's the cargo, um, you know, and what's the current situation. So things are actually you know very very dynamic from that perspective. Um, here you can see um, a couple of snaps, one of Al Jazeera's and one of Gibraltar. Um, and uh, Maersk on their, I think it was their MR3 um, or MS3 uh, voyage the other day announced that um, they would they would be calling in at, at, at these locations. Now, Al Jazeera in particular is a very, very busy location. Um, the other day when I took this, um, there were, where are we, with 47 vessels um, in, in the port boundary. You can see the geo fence there, of which 44 were, um, uh, uh, sorry, 47 were at birth. 44 were expected within the next seven days. And typically in Al Jazeera and, and Gibraltar, um, you're going to see between 10 and 20 vessels arriving um, at any given, uh, within any 24 period. However, um, there is a there's a comparative number also uh, also departing and sailing. So um, I took some snips on uh, turnaround time. So uh, container turnaround in Al Jazeera is 16 hours at the moment. Um, tankers are 22 hours, uh, and uh, Gibraltar is very very similar, around about that 22 23 hours. So clearly there is a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of traffic going through there. Um, and one thing to be clear there, you know, one of our recommendations is do plan ahead and, and make sure your bunkers are, are booked. There is capacity, um, but uh, you just want to make sure that uh, you're, you're going to get the slot you want to as well. Next slide, thanks. So the other one of the other areas we wanted to touch on is um, the Suez Canal. So um, there's been a, a building issue, I think, is, is perhaps the way I'd actually put it about Panama. So um, we've had, had drought conditions for, for several years now. Um, they've added in an extra set of locks. So now there's two sets of locks, which in theory can handle 40 vessels a day. Um, but there's also been a massive increase in population. There's vaporization of water as well. Um, so this has all created kind of a critical um, uh, critical situation for for the Panama Panama Canal. So uh, in July uh, they brought in what they call Condition Three, which reduced capacity down to um, uh, typically down to 32, of which 27 were available through bookings. Um, but more recently they've they've had to reduce that even further. So bookings are now down to uh, down to 24 a day. So that's almost half of of what there was before. Um, currently, there's uh, 57 vessels waiting to uh, cross through the Panama Canal. Um, uh, 43 of those are already pre-booked. Um, several of those that, that are actually waiting are small vessels. One, one of the, the things that, that can be done through the Panama Canal is if you have a smaller vessel, you can tandem or, or piggyback with a larger vessel going through. So they will put two, two vessels through um, at the same time. Um, one of uh, the things, if you actually look on the uh, the Inchicate website, uh, we ran a, a webinar on um, uh, we ran a webinar on uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, we'll be doing another one um, uh, very very shortly as well. Um, there's another webinar about the um, about the Magellan Straits as well. Um, one thing I would say again in summary on the Panama Canal is that, that the restrictions are going to continue for some time. But the market, if you like, has already adapted. So we did hear in early January of a, uh, an LNG vessel 
uh, going through at four million dollars is was the bid rate for for the uh, uh, for the ongoing auction. Um, last week, uh, a Panamax went through at fifty five thousand um, dollars. At the moment, the market seems to adjusted down to about that three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar for transit. Um, and um, whenever there is a free slot, there is then an auction, which is which is where this is coming from. But as I say, we do have a briefing on Panama, which we will share, um, and there will be a further Panama briefing coming up shortly. Do you want to go to the next slide, David? I'm just uh, aware of time, so I just want to get get this. We give people some time questions now. The Magellan Straits is is not only a viable option; it has been since 2021 when these drought conditions actually started. And you can see there that uh, to the end of 2023, um, there's been a steady increase. Um, as part of our, our work in reporting on Panama, we'll also be publishing the monthly uh, Magellan, Tra Magellan Straits transit uh, information as well. Um, it is quite complicated. So um, there's a number of transit areas. Um, you'll need to uh, pick up pilots, two to three pilots as you transit through. Um, and also, if you're not stopping in Chile, you also have to arrange for um, that last pilot to be to be returned. Um, again, Captain uh, Amit, who I spoke about earlier, has got a lot of experience with this, and he tells some tales about um, uh, disembarking um, pilots in some some pretty horrible weather down there as well. But it but it is an option. Um, a number you can see there, the big increase on that. And as I say, we'll we'll continue to put out um, uh, information on that as well. Next slide, David. And then, and then lastly, um, we've got you know some of the other um, disruptions and incidents that, um, that that we've spoken about earlier. Weather, and, and I think weather is increasingly something that's going to Im impact our industry and and shipping in particular. So, um, just last week, the Houston terminals were closed because of ice. Um, don't really associate Texas with with bad weather, but it can get. They had snow last year, and as I say, they've had ice in a number of locations. Um, I also touched on uh, Port Louis in uh, in Mauritius and the disruption they've had recently. Civil disturbance is an is another um, another issue. So Ecuador is is quite well published the, the things that have been going on there. Um, but Papua New Guinea they have uh, a state emergency. And I and I have read that um, there's been disruption in Australia due to strikes, and clearly we had uh, other strikes in France last year, which which caused some very severe delays around around French ports as well. Um, crime again, Roberts Roberts touched on this. Um, so um, not only assault, um, but also narcotics. Narcotics is is a major issue. Um, uh, you see there about a a mortar flag bulk carrier. Um, where 300 kilograms of cocaine was found. Um, it's almost daily now that we see, you know, a very large consignment of um, of cocaine, and not only coming to Europe, but also around Asia, particularly around Malaysia, Indonesia, those locations um, there, and even China uh, are seeing a, a massive increase in in narcotics. Um, and then the last area again. You know, uh, it, it's it's not only the disruption you may see if you are going around Cape of Good Hope with uh, from Western Sahara, um, but also stowaways are, are another issue. And so a couple of the services that we we offer to help mitigate this, so particularly around narcotics, we offer K9 teams to actually inspect vessels. Um, and um, around um, stowaways, we can offer a stowaway inspections. Um, and uh, obviously other security services in, in partnership with Ambre as well. Next slide. So this is this is my last slide. Um, I, I guess I guess the the message for me is don't panic. Um, the industry is going to adapt. Um, you know, whether there's a seller or whether there's a buyer, um, they're going to find each other. Um, this diagram here, you can see what happened um, prior to um, uh, the Russian sanctions coming in. So that's the dotted lines. A lot of that was actually going through uh, pipeline. Um, and, um, and and now with the, the more solid line, you can see, well, you know, other other providers have actually have actually fulfilled that. If if um, Israeli or American or UK cargoes are not able to go through the Suez, 
um, or you know vessels going from Qatar and and and, uh, and and that area around and back through the Suez, chances are they'll go to China or they'll find another route. Uh, so um, this is this is from our uh, our friends at, at Kepler who who very kindly provided this. Um, the market is going to adapt. It's absolutely going to adapt, um, and you know those trends and everything will become clear in you know very very short time. I think so. Recommendations from Inchcape is build a network of trusted data sources and data providers. So you know people like Ambre, people like ourselves. We have we have what we would call human intelligence. You know we have people sitting in ports that can certainly advise and guide. Um, do a thorough risk ass assessment. Um, and I know a number of people have have served in various navies and various armies and various armed forces. And we have a phrase of the five P's. Perfect preparation prevents poor performance. Um, and basically that's about planning. It's about thinking about what might go wrong and then training your mariners. So as we saw in that video with the vessel strike, that the mariners, mariners need to be aware of um, you know, the risks and trained accordingly, how to get to the citadel if there is an issue, you know, and that kind of thing as well. And I guess one last line, one last phrase I'd leave you with is there's no replacement for forethought. You know, do consider all possibilities and activities that may happen on your voyage and, and work with your trusted uh, information providers and service providers to fulfill on that. So I'll stop there. Um, David, do you want to do you want to highlight some? I think we've got a couple of questions. Yes, thank you very much, Ian. We have a question. Do you foresee any risk regarding Egypt and the Suez Canal? Two, how is the Houthi situation impacting India? Um, is there any real chance Houthis will stop the situation and, and will calm down in um, Israel-Gaza conflict? I can comment on that, if you like. Um, the negotiations, so the Houthis started to target merchant shipping in response um, to the, as part of their contribution, if you like, to the Israel-Gaza conflict. <clears throat> if there is a ceasefire, um, which could be negotiated soon, we may see a reduction in threat, particularly if it's a long, longer term ceasefire. Um, having said that, the Houthis did not abide by the November 2023 ceasefire, so we will see. Um, in terms of the um, targeting of Egypt and the Suez Canal, that has not happened so far. We do not expect that to happen. Um, the Egyptians are acting as mediators in the Israel-Gaza conflict. Um, they've shot down, they've intercepted missiles, UAVs over their um, air, airspace. Um, but have not contributed to the US-UK military strikes um, on, on the Houthis, and we do not expect them to, um, to do that. I have a question here that I think Ian, you could probably speak to. Has there been any, any impact on cruise vessel rerouting due to the Red Sea, Red sea situation? How will the congestion evolve in South Africa due to rerouting around the Cape of Good Hope? Um, and then the third part of the question, will rail connections between the EU and China start to get overbooked and cease um, freight increases? Um, well, on the uh, on the cruise, um, um, we're coming to the end of the, uh, the cruise season. Uh, for those of you who don't know, cr cruise is very seasonal. So at the moment, we're seeing um, Southern Hemisphere um, cruise um, being uh, that, that's kind of the current season. So Australasia, South America, um, we have seen a bit of disruption around South America in terms of particularly around Ecuador um, as well. Um, what uh, we will see and uh, we actually are, are actually receiving inquiries from is those vessels will transit between between the seasons. And so over the coming months, we're being asked to about rerouting vessels around uh, Cape of Good Hope um so will there be any impacts yes but they'll go around they'll go around africa so we're actually we're actually seeing that now um that kind of leads into your next question about um congestion so um and, and it's interesting david's actually uh, no, uh he's currently in london but he's normally based in um in durban so there, there, there's 
there's not really congestion around around southern Africa. What we're typically seeing is people requesting bunkers in Europe or Singapore. And so, you know, the um, the the um, there is there is disruption in Cape Town, but that's due to local sort of taxation or financial issues there. Durban, there's not we're not really seeing that much congestion. Um, and then the only other issues is is really around um, Mauritius, which which are weather. And you know, there's more than enough capacity in, in Mauritius um, and availability of bunkers there. So um, it is. You know, it, it it's normally day to day. You know, oh, there's a storm, therefore you can't come into the inner port in Russia. It, it's not it's not that that much of a major issue um, that that we've seen. You know, and again, the market will adapt. Um, uh, you know, very very quickly. And um, but there's no shortage of bunkers. Um, uh, that the, uh, you know of uh, of fuel um, um, that's that's available there as well. Sorry, what's the third question? Is there a third question on that one? All right. I moved off of it. One second. It was um, will rail connections between the EU and China start to get overbooked uh, and see freight increases? Um, well, so I'm not an expert on this um, by by any chalk, but again, I think if you have an urgent cargo that has a shelf life, you will see prices for that adapt. You know, people will move in some cases onto airlines, but there is not the capacity. There is absolute. You can't stick 4, 14,000 or twenty thousand containers on a on a train and and expect the same sort of throughput on that. So will prices increase temporarily? I think. Uh, and again, this is my personal view, not the company view. But but also, I think you know the the container rates will 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 settle out. Um, you know, consumers will get used to it taking a week or two. You know, for their goods to turn out. Um, I've, I've, got, I do a lot of cycling. I've got a new, a, a new race bike uh, on order. I'm pretty sure it's going to be here in the summer. So, so, so I'm okay with that. The, the market will adapt. I think is, is the quick thing. But I don't really see land or air being able to take in that much capacity that is, is perhaps around vessels. And the capacity hasn't gone away. It's just delayed by a week or two. Um. I'm mindful that there's quite a few questions and we're running out of time. Um, I think what we could potentially do here is, is answer a lot of these questions and publish them along with the video on our websites uh, to address anything we can't get to today. Um, I think one final question in closing um, yeah. for you, Robert. Mm -hmm. Do you see either the option that Armed Guard shall board outside of the JWLA or that the JWC will enhance again the listed area to what um, is um, was sorry 2015? Uh, can you speak of privacy? Uh, yeah. Sorry, piracy in the in the in the IO. Yeah. So if there is a significant loss, so in other words, if the ransom is as significant as we are hearing. Um, it is likely to consider it is likely to trigger the JWC to consider their uh, area as it took place outside of their listed area. Um, in terms of the shipping industry and how it responds, this will likely depend on how that ransom is then reinvested. So whether it is allowed to be reinvested through shoreside security, um, trying to um, stop that um, and stop the pirates then going out to sea again. Um, we have seen increased interest in armed guards, in unarmed um, advisors on the bridge and in our digital services already. Um, but in terms of a lot of shipping companies will want to recover those costs and they will need the uh, JWC and other charterers, for example, to um, recognise the extended threat and um, mandate the use of uh, enhanced measures to, to, to mitigate this. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for, for joining this webinar. Um, we hope it's been uh, useful to you. Um, I've put the email address for both Ambry and Inchcape Shipping Services in the chat section. Um, if at all you would like to arrange a, a personalized um, a meeting with any of us so that we can go over this in more detail, please do let us know. Um, 
And as I've already mentioned, we will publish the recording of this video on our websites. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Robert. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody.